Hello and welcome back for another episode of Write America. This literary series was dreamed up by author Roger Rosenblatt in an effort to bridge the great divide in our country through readings and conversations from award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers. My name is Lauren and I will be your host for the evening. If you are not familiar with us, Book Review is Long Island's largest independent bookstore located in Huntington, New York. Uh, we have a great episode in store for you tonight featuring readings from writers Vijay Sheshadri and Kaylee Jones. Uh, if you missed last week's episode uh, was a special episode with Rita Dove and Roger Rosenblatt um, or any of the previous episodes of Write America for that matter you can go uh, to Book Review's Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Uh, tonight's episode is also being recorded so if you miss something you can always go back and watch uh, the episode again. Now, before we get started with the readings, there's just a couple of things that I would like to um, show you about Crowdcast so that um, you know how the event works tonight. Um, first off, there is a button right down here. Uh, if you click that button, uh, it says buy signed copies of Vijay and Kaylee's books. It will bring you to bookreview.com where you can purchase signed copies of their books. Uh, there is also a button down here that says ask a question. Um, if you have a question at any point during the event for um, either of the writers, you can just drop it down below by clicking ask a question. Um, and then I see that some of you have found the chat, so please feel free uh, to talk amongst yourselves, comment on the event, and of course, drop your emoji applause so that we know that we that you like what you're hearing. Um, and let me see. And that's all um, I have for you, so let's get on with the readings. Um, our first reader tonight is Vijay Shesadri. Uh, Vijay is the author of five books of poetry, as well as many essays, reviews, and memoir fragments. His work has been widely published and anthology and recognized with a number of honors, among them the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and the Literature Award of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So please welcome to your screen, Vijay Shesadri. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, hi. There's feedback. Is Are you hearing feedback? Um, I don't, but let, what I'll do right now is I'll close out your video really quick and bring you back on and hopefully that will fix it. So let's just okay. do that really quickly. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Let's see. Okay. That might just take a second. Right. How about now? Is it better? Uh, I'm here. I'm hearing an, I'm hearing an echo of myself when I have the the that's weird it wasn't just doing that during our little test can i just take leave them off or is that bad for you guys um for now that'll be fine but for the conversation we'll have to okay. try them again and see if it works and uh you can all hear me okay mm -hmm. okay good okay uh hi everyone i want to thank roger and lauren for this uh wonderful event and it's just been an amazing epic journey for them and i've caught some of the readings i haven't caught all of them and uh, i'm glad they're on now uh, they've been recorded so i can go back and think of them as an archive maybe even to have it sarah lawrence i'm uh going to read you know nell painter is here hello nell and she says in chat, looking forward to new poems by Vijay Shashadri. Uh, I have not written any new poems now. I've been, but I have been writing. I've been writing prose throughout COVID. Uh, so what I'm going to do is not read any new poems, but read one very old poem. And then one poem from uh, my latest book, which came out last uh, fall. And the old poem is a narrative poem which lasts about eight minutes. And uh, and the new and you know the somewhat new poem is very short. And the old poem is called Lifeline. And the reason I chose this poem was of the title of this series, which is Write America. And I thought, well, this is my most American poem. And uh, or at least that's the way I think of it, that uh, in some sense, 
it's purely allegorical, but it's allegorical of my American experience or my American experience as I understood it at the time I wrote the poem, which was in the early and mid nineties. And it's a poem about someone who gets lost in the woods and it refers to, uh, goes back to a period when I was living on the central Oregon coast, which is something about which I'm writing prose now. So it has a lot of intersections for me in relationship to both uh, this event and the current work that I'm doing. And uh, here's the poem. It's called Lifeline. As soon as he realized he was lost, that in kicking around his new job in his head, the new people he'd met and how he could manage a week in seaside. He'd stumbled past the muddy fork of road that slithered down in switchbacks to Highway 20 and now couldn't tell through rain clouds coarse as pig iron and about as cold, which languished over each of the scarred mountaintops. Where west was or east or north or feel the sun's direction, he stopped as he knew he should and doubled back. An hour at the worst would bring him to the international, inert in a ditch with its radiator punctured, its axle broken and blood from his temple on the steering wheel. He wished he'd never set eyes on that truck. Here he was trudging like an idiot through a thousand square mile dead spot of Douglas fir soaked to the bone and hungry with his head throbbing. He wasn't up to this, he said to himself, staring disconsolately outward to the numberless ridges and valleys singed with the bitter green of the firs. But why hadn't he reached the truck yet, or at least somewhere familiar, where he could get his bearings again? He didn't recognize the ridge he was on. He'd never seen this particular patch glinting with wild crocus prongs of clear-cut ground, torched and scarified. Should he keep going or return again? There and then he made his third mistake. Hearing or thinking he heard, deep in the valley below him plunged in mist, a chainsaw start and sputter. He made off down toward the sound. It would be a jippo logger scrounging deadfall cedar for shakebolt cords, or a civilian with a $20 permit to cut firewood for sale at a roadside stand. Either way, he could get directions and hitch home by dark. Hours later, night found him in a hollow, shouting until he was hoarse for someone, anyone. The weekend was almost here and no one at work would miss him before Monday. He lived alone, idiot, he lived alone and couldn't count on a single person to send out an alarm. Those first hours he spent shivering under a lip of rock, wide awake, startling at each furtive night hunting animal sound, each flap of the raptors and the branches overhead. On the second day, he lost his glasses. It happened like this. As he struggled over the cryptic terrain all morning, terrain that would seem if looked at from high above, from a helicopter or a plane flying low enough to pierce the dense, lazy foliage of clouds, created, finessed, meticulously contrived to amaze, like a marvelous relief map of paper mache revealing its artifice only in the improbable dramas of its contours, its extravagant, unlikely colors. He had what amounted to a real insight. All this was the brainchild of water, stretching back beyond the Pleistocene. How many millions of years, imperial reign are traced without pity, over and over again, its counter image on the newborn jagged mountains until the length of the coast had been disciplined to a system on purpose designed 
to irrigate and to nourish the soil. He decided he'd follow the water down. He'd use each widening tributary like the rung of a ladder to climb down from his awful predicament and soon work his way to the ocean. Though, of course, long before that he'd run across people. With this in mind, he came to a stream, heavy and brown with the spring runoff, its embankment on his side steep to the point of perpendicularity, thick with brush, though on the other side a crown of ferns tumbled gently down to the next watershed. It seemed like a good idea to cross, and farther on he found a log fir with a choker cable still attached. It must have snapped when they tried to yard the fall tree to the road high above, straddling the stream. A little more than halfway over, he slipped on the treacherous wood and would have gone in but for the cable, which he lunged at just in time. That was his lifeline, though flailing to save himself, he knocked the glasses from his head. Now they'd reach the sea long before him, if he ever would. He knelt down in the ferns, exhausted, by fits growing determined never to leave that spot. They'd find his bones fifty years from now, clothes and ID rotted away, a trillium poking through his ribcage, a cucumber vine trellised by the seven sockets in his skull. The play of the thin, unending drizzle on the overlapping leaves he sank below, on the bark of the impassive trees looming around him, grew indistinguishable from the pulse turning loud in his head. The ugly bruise on his forehead throbbed. There were rents and gashes everywhere down the length of his rain gear, which let the mist and the dampness in. Beyond a scant dozen inches, the world looked blurry, smeared bright, unattainable. Nothing in his life, up until then, and if this had been pointed out to him, he would have acknowledged pride in it, suggested that anything resembling a speculative turn of mind cannibalized the adequate, rhythmic, progressive movements of his thoughts and feelings. But still, as almost everyone does, he'd occasionally had inklings, stirrings, promptings, and strange intuitions about something just beyond the radius of his life. Not divine necessarily, but what people meant when they referred to such things, which gave to the least of his actions its dream of complicity. Now he recognized with a shock almost physical that those inklings were just the returning, reanimated echo on a different scale but similar to the echo we sometimes hear in our skulls which leads us to the uncanny feeling that ex an experience we're having is one we've had before at some other time. But does anything ever repeat himself? The returning, reanimated echo of the vibrations his life made bouncing off the things around him, sunk deep in their own being. And that life, his life, Blossoming now in this daisy chain of accident and error was nothing more or less than what there was. There was nothing hidden underneath this, but it was small, so small, as the life of his family was, his people, his species among the other species, furs, owls, plants whose names he didn't know, all of the minute and the earth itself, its four billion plus years of life, just the faint phosphorescent track of a minute sea creature on an ocean for the annihilating dimensions of which words such as infinite and eternal were ridiculous in their inadequacy. 
He lay on his back inside the ferns and listened to the rain's clepsydral ticking. He tried to grasp. What was it? But it clattered away, that slight change in the pressure binding thing to thing, as when an upright sleeper shifts just a little, imparting to his dreams an entirely different train of meaning. Beyond those clouds, the blue was there, which shaded to blackness. And beyond that blackness, the uncounted, terrifying celestial entities hung suspended only by the influence they had on one another. And all of this was just a seed inside a seed inside a seed. So that when, finally, late the next morning, he half crawled out of the woods and came in time to a wire fence in a clearing, less than two feet high and decorated with gleaming ceramic insulators, which indicated that a mild current, five volts at the most, ran through it to keep the foraging animals off the newly sown vegetable garden enclosed inside its perimeter and saw beyond it the sprawl of the lawn, the four by four parked on the driveway the stars and stripes on the flagpole, and the house. He stopped, paralyzed. The wind was blowing northwest. The clouds were breaking up under its steady persuasion. But try as he did, he couldn't will himself to step lightly over that wire and cross the garden's sweet geometry and go up to the door and ask to be fed and made warm and taken home. By that small fence, he sat down and wept. Okay. Hi. So was the sound okay for that? We are getting a little bit of feedback. Um, just try unplugging your headphones and plugging it back in again. I wanna see if that changes anything. Was it okay? Oh. Oh, see now I don't hear anything. No feedback oh. at all. Did you hear it? Did you hear it before? We did, but I we were able to hear you fine. So um I think the problem is fixed. <laughs> okay. I, well I plugged the the headphones back in. It sounds be much better now. Did you have another reading to do or was I that have one other poem, but did you did you hear that? Did yeah, you hear we the did. first one? Yes, you heard we the did. First one? Yes, so I'll leave you to do the, the second one now. <laughs> okay, I'll read the second one now. It's Thank a short you. one. That was long. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to close with this poem. And it's the first poem in my book, new book. It's called Road Trip which is also very American in its theme, in its title anyway. Uh, road trip. I could complain, I've done it before. I could explain. I could say, for instance, that I'm sick of being slaughtered in my life's mountain passes, covering my own long retreat, the rear guard of my own brutal defeat dysentery and frostbite and snipers, the mules freezing to death, blizzards whipping the famished fires until they expire, the pathetic mosquito notes of my horn. But instead, for once, I'm keeping quiet and maybe tomorrow, or maybe the day after, or maybe the day after that, I'm just going to drive away down the coast and not come back. I haven't told anyone, and I won't. I won't dim with words the radiance of my gesture. And besides, the ones who care have guessed already. Looking at them, looking at me, I know they know. When they turn their backs, I'll go. The secrets I was planning to floor them with? They're already packed in my trunk in straw in a reinforced casket. The bitter but herbal and medicinal truths I concocted to revive them with? Tomorrow or the day after or the day after that. 
on the volcano beaches fringed with black sand and heaped with tangled beds of kelp, by the obsidian tide pools that cradle the ribbed limpet and the rock-bound star. I'll scatter those truths to the sea breezes and float the secrets on the waters that the moon reels in and plays out, reels in and plays out, with a little votive candle burning on their casket. And then I'll just be there in the sunset's coppery sheen, in the dawn pearled by discreet oblong intimate clouds that move without desire or motive. Look at the clouds. Look how close they are. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn your camera and mic off for the time being, but we will see you back at the end for the conversation. So thank you so much, Vijay. All right. Up next, we have a reading from Kaylee Jones. Uh, Kaylee is the author of Lies My Mother Never Told Me, a publisher's weekly starred review memoir chosen as one of the hottest summer reads by the Palm Beach Pulse, the Daily Beast, and the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Uh, Kaylee has taught in the public schools of New York City through Teachers and Writers Collaborative and has helped found the MFA program in, write MFA program in writing at Long Island University, which is now SUNY Stony Brook Southampton campus, and the MFA writing program, uh, um, MFA program program in writing at Wilkes University. Uh, she teaches memoir, literature, and fiction at both schools. So please welcome to the screen, Kaylee Jones. Hi, Kaylee. Hi. <laughs> it was wonderful, Vijay, and, and I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to see our audience see the comments. It's wonderful <laughs> to be here all the way from San Diego, California. I'm going to read um, uh, an essay that was just published. Uh, it's in the uh, July-August um, um, edition of uh, Hippocampus, uh, Hippocampus magazine. Um, it's called Studying the Dystopian Novel During the COVID-19 Pandemic. <clears throat> in August 2019, I was asked to teach a course on dystopian fiction for spring semester 2020 at Stony Brook University's MFA program in creative writing, where I've been teaching for many years. This seemed at the time like an exciting opportunity to further explore a genre that has always fascinated me. Dystopian fiction is a warning bell tolling in the distance, urging us to pay attention, to beware, to curtail our greed, our arrogance, our zealotry, or else the future of the planet may look something like the oppressed, ravaged worlds worlds that are conjured to life in many of these novels. We spent the first seven weeks of the course reading and discussing the rise and fall of vast empires, nuclear holocausts, and oppressive dictatorships in imagined societies. My left of center leanings were no secret to my four young graduate students, although I attempted to stay away from current politics, no easy task. Between the end of January and early March, as we read and discussed Yevgeny Zamyatin's We, Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, and Octavia Butler's Lilith's Brood, among others, we, <clears throat> the spread of the novel coronavirus grew more and more dire. High casualties in Italy, France, and Spain, and by February, reports of hotspots in Washington State, California, and New York. By the second week of March, out in Southhold, Long Island, where I was staying, COVID-19 had spread through the community at alarming speed. Riverheadlocal.com stated, quote, Southhold Town's confirmed coronavirus cases were the highest among every town in Suffolk County on a case per thousand basis and more than double the rate in the country as a whole. On Stony Brook's Southampton campus, not far from Southhold, where I was teaching my seminar, the mostly empty dorms were being used to quarantine SUNY students returning from semesters abroad. On Tuesday, March 10th, I watched the president insist on national television that, quote, we're prepared and we're doing a great job with it and it will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. I left the house feeling like I was living through a Vonnegut novel where foolish bureaucrats make the rules and the rules make no app applicable sense in our real world. Our next book was Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, where in the near future, following a catastrophic drop in the birth rate, 
a repressive Christian fundamentalist theocracy has overthrown the US government. Women have lost their human and civil rights and those who are deemed subversive, but who can still bear children are enslaved as reproductive chattel. The first time I read The Handmaid's Tale was in the early 90, 1980s. I found the novel thoughtful and entertaining, but improbable. Even under Reagan, I never for a moment considered a government takeover by the Christian far right, a possibility because I had faith. I had faith in the constitution. Reading Atwood again now was profoundly unsettling. I walked into class on Tuesday afternoon to find my students waiting for me in total silence, not chatting and laughing as they normally were. Their faces were expectant, gloomy expressions. Within a matter of weeks, this course had taken a turn from speculative fiction to not so speculative at all. Quote, please tell me the dystopian world we live in is a simulation. Please tell me it's only coincidence that I took a dystopian literature class as the world progressively becomes a dystopia. Please tell me that lie swallowing Americans that lick the boots of the government will realize the indescribable insanity of blind obedience. From Isolation, an essay by MFA candidate Jen Cooper. I sat down in my chair, took a deep breath and asked my students to pause for a minute to consider the bizarre circumstances, stances that found us sitting here in the middle of the worst national crisis our country had faced since World War II. Did any of them note the parallels between the fictitious Gilead and our new reality in the United States? There were parallels, they agreed. Jen, a non-binary non LGBTQ activist, said they felt like they'd been living through The Handmaid's Tale <clears throat> since the 2016 election. Mackenzie chimed in. She was also disturbed by the current rise in Christian fundamentalism in our nation, as well as, as the racist, racism and anti-Semitism brought about by the resurgence of the white supremacist movement, a movement that in every important way shares the same values as the fascist theocratic government in The Handmaid's Tale. I wanted to calm their fears. This would be our last meeting before spring break. I urged them to be vigilant, to follow the CDC's guide, guidelines, to watch the news and to check the sources. <clears throat> In creative writing programs, the line between our public and private lives is so thin, it's sometimes phrase. I shared that I was still planning to leave for California on Friday. I was very worried for my daughter who just graduated from college and was alone in our new home. She didn't yet have a driver's license. And if we truly went into some kind of major lockdown, she would be stranded and alone. I told them how my daughter and I had gone through a period of bitter fighting, followed by alienation when our family life came to a crashing end with her father's hospitalization for treatment resistant depression and his suicide two years ago. Buying this house together in San Diego had been an act of faith, and we were still on tenuous ground. My students nodded in silence. We didn't know then that we would never meet again in person. Quote, as each week of quarantine passed and people rioted to open up the country, flooded the beaches without masks or social distance, and the government sent bailout checks to the industries chiefly responsible for cultivating and spreading the disease, it became even more clear that the dystopian blueprints were right. From Dystopian Thoughts, an essay by MFA candidate Jimmy Hintner. Hintner. On Thursday, March 12th, a state of emergency was declared for Southhold Township. I agonized over my decision to fly. A friend drove me to JFK on March 13th. In the airport and on the plane, I was so concerned that I might unknowingly be carrying the virus that I wore a surgical mask and gloves and disinfected my seat, tray table, and armrests with Clorox wipes. If I'd learned anything from teaching dystopian fiction, it was to listen to that distant tolling bell. I did everything I could to protect others as well as myself. On March 19th, a statewide shelter at home order was decreed for California. The next day, Stony Brook announced that all courses would resume online and maintain virtual and remain virtual for the rest of the semester. My students and I mastered Zoom and our weekly discussions continued. No one ever showed up late. No one shirked the work. Cal, one of the two young men 
contracted COVID-19 and was very sick, yet he missed only one class. Of all our discussions, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of, of Electric Sheep stands out in my mind, the only novel chosen by class vote. On that day, April 28th, COVID-19 cases in the U.S. had reached 981,134 with 50,327 fatalities. Out walking our dog that morning, I ran into a neighbor, a friendly retired Navy officer. When he saw my terrified expression, he scoffed. The flu kills more people, he said, and he wasn't going to say, change his life for this bullshit. Dick's novel describes a poisoned earth blown to ashes by World War Terminus. Almost all animal life has perished. Owning a real live animal becomes every human's deepest desire. The rich have fled to Mars and are trying to rebuild society in a gravely inhospitable climate. They create androids to do the dirty work. Androids are slaves and are treated as slaves. But some androids, smarter, stronger, more resilient, revolt and flee to Earth to try to pass as humans in order to live free. I pose my students this question. If sexual intercourse with androids is illegal, why are they given sexual organs? Human arrogance, they said. Human greed. Quote, is there a sensation more rooted in the physical than the struggle for breath? Is there a more poignant reminder to our self-important minds that they are reliant on the more base organs for life? From Flesh and Spirit, an essay by MFA candidate Cal Uricki. The bounty hunter who is charged with annihilating the escaped androids carries around an empathy test. The only way to prove an android is not human, but the test is fallible. Humans sometimes fail it. So how can he be certain he's killing an android and not a human? But more importantly, I ask my students, do the androids deserve to be exterminated? We were divided. Jen and I felt the androids had as much right to live as the humans, the stupid, arrogant humans who blew up their own planet over a disagreement over what? Principles? Politics? Mackenzie wanted to problem solve for a third solution, neither annihilation nor coexistence, but one in which humans took responsibility for the sentient beings they'd created. But the other two, Jimmy and Cal, felt the androids were a danger were not human and therefore should be exterminated. Cal's position was that the androids were biologically not human. They posed a threat and must be neutralized. But I identified with the androids. I grew up with emotional abuse at the hands of a narcissistic parent. I'd felt dehumanized, completely controlled by a power beyond my control. Besides biologically, I asked, how are the androids less than human? They don't feel empathy, they replied. But they do feel empathy, I countered. They were not programmed for empathy, yet they develop empathy, even love for each other. Doesn't that make them sentient beings? What makes us human in the end, I asked. Are the humans in the novel capable of empathy towards each other or the androids? A long silence ensued. I called a short break and went downstairs to regroup my daughter was watching Rachel Maddow, who was in tears over the lack of personal protective equipment and available tests for the frontline workers. Maddow, her voice shaking, read the CDC's updated, quote, recommendations, unquote, for the U.S. meat processing plant, whose workers were being forced to return to their jobs despite an explosion of cases among them. Damn, I thought, now we can't even trust the CDC. I felt such rage and help helplessness I started crying. My daughter got up and came to hug me. If someone had told me four years ago, mom, that we were going to have a pandemic and you and I would voluntarily go into lockdown together, I never would have believed it. I'm so glad you're here. I mentioned our class argument over the fate of the androids in Dick's novel. What did she think? Did the androids deserve to live? Of course the androids deserve to live, she said. I'd taken her to the Holocaust Museum in DC when she was in eighth grade. Her class was going there soon on a field trip and I didn't want her to see it for the first time with anyone but me. When we got to the Hall of Heroes at the very end of the exhibit, she looked around and asked, why didn't more people do something? 
because they had families, I told her, and they were scared. Would you have risked your life? She asked. I told her that when I'd been single or even married, I most certainly might have risked my life. But now, having a child, I wasn't sure. She replied that she hoped I would risk her life to take a stand. Quote, if disaster were to affect my world, I believed I would be the boy from the road, the one who gives a dying man a can of fruit, even when it might mean his own starvation, the one who still believes a spaceship might save them all, the one who forgives a deadly thief. I would be the one with hope. Hope would guide my actions. I was wrong. From the boy, an essay by MFA candidate Mackenzie Watterson. Now I blew my nose, wiped my eyes, and went back upstairs to rejoin my Zoom class. My daughter thinks the androids deserve to live, I told my students. Jem, Jen pumped their fist. I finally broke down and got political. To our present government, I said, every frontline worker, every elder, every disenfranchised minority, every person with a pre-existing condition could be the androids in Philip K. Dick's novel all expendable, acceptable collateral damage, as in a war, but this, is, but this pandemic is not a war and with proper leadership could have been avoided. We continued our discussion, but no one's position shifted on the fate of the androids. In closing, I pointed out that exceptional books are eternal because they live in that gray area between right and wrong, good and bad, and leave it up to us, the reader, to decide. Exhausted, I took our dog out for, out for a walk along the protected wetlands that stretch for miles beyond our house. The California daisies were in full bloom along the path, a riot of yellow as far as the eye could see. A white tornado of, tornado of fosters turned circled overhead, the black spot on their faces still visible against the darkening sky. For them, little had changed. At that moment, the bugle recall sounded from the SEAL training base across the marsh. Every day since the lockdown, my daughter and I pause at sunset to hear the recall, such a consistent paternal reminder that life goes on. But the walking path and the main road in the distance, usually jammed at this hour, were empty, and the bugle sounded forlorn. All I could do was mutter under my breath, my God, please help us fix this before it's too late. Thank you. I've never read it out loud wow. before. Sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm looking at the VJ. You're there too. You you're looking at the um, mm -hmm. I at am. The comments. Yes. Nell says your account of your students and the fate of the androids makes me think about American slavery. Yes, exactly. And I think that was what he was talking about as well. And we did a lo a lot of talking about slavery during um, mm. during that class. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I loved your reading, Vijay. It was really beautiful. Yeah. It's interesting that they're very close to each other, these pieces. They're both about being lost, you know, with a spiritual dimension to them. And uh, that's right. That's absolutely right. And um, I still don't feel quite unlost yet. That this is it's not quite done, um, but it it was certainly um, a very um, intense experience to feel that my role as a teacher was suddenly bigger. It was sort of amplified by that um, strange coincidence of of teaching about the end of the of the world as we know it and having this yeah. happen at the same time. Wow! Yeah. 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 I mean, I I haven't known what to do with COVID. Yeah, I haven't been able to write about it. And 
people have asked me for poems and I say, wow. All I can do is feel anger, you know, at uh, yeah. political failure. And, uh, so I really commend you for that. It's just really extraordinary. And you kept the tension all the way through. There was oh, no point you. at which the line of the argument was slack. Oh, thank really you. Beautifully <laughs> written. Yeah. You know, I I wanted to include all the essays, those four essays that they wrote about this experience. And um, as most, you know, most situations in publishing, everything had to be cut down. You know, the, my essay was cut down. Their essays were quoted, but not there in their, in their entirety. Um, but they, uh, you know, they really worked hard in that class. And they really did see the connections between, uh, you know, the books we were reading and and what was going on mm -hmm. um, with us. You know, I loved your two poems, and I felt really nervous for the 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 narrator in the narrative poem, the first one. Yeah. Uh, but I knew it would be okay. But th I thought that ending was beautiful, really, really powerful too. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I for uh, for some reason I keep coming back to that poem now. I don't think I'd read it for, you know, maybe fifteen years before mm -hmm. COVID happened, and uh, and the kind the bewilderment I wanted to represent is something that I've felt throughout COVID, you know, and. And the mystification mm. about being in some circumstances that are overwhelming, you know. So yeah. how do you kind of circle yourself in some way and reconstitute your imagination in such a way that you can deal with something like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, right now I'm writing about Bangladesh, where which is sort of that's where the global warming apocalypse is going to land first mm. because it's the largest river delta in the world and 30% of it is under five meters above sea level. Mm. And so, uh, and I'm having that same feeling of bewilderment. How do you describe this and how do you write about it? That's yeah, really interesting problem. The new problem, right? Yes. How do you, are you approaching it from a personal narrative standpoint, or are, are you have you decided how you're going to? Yeah, when I was there, I'm gonna. I mean, I'm not putting myself in it, uh, but it is a personal essay in that. The experiences I'm describing are ones that I had, although they're described neutrally. And, uh, and you know, talk about enslavement. The, 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 the poverty in the country is such that, you know, people have no wiggle room. They have no way to move. And there's something tremendously heroic about the way the Bangladeshis are trying to pull themselves out of what they're in, you know? And then the callousness of human beings, right? I mean, India understands, for example, that uh, this is happening to Bangladesh. And what have they done? They built a fence around the country, you know? And, and they have military patrolling, you know, mm -hmm. crucial spots where refugees might come over, you know? Oh. I mean, it's just, I mean, the world we're going into, wow. Not not near me, but in Northern California right now, and actually last summer, the fires were so intense that our our sky and the, you know, the, the ocean front was completely gray with uh, smoke cloud cover. And the, the fires burned so much. And yet people continue to think that we can master and control 
Mm -hmm. this landscape, you know, and it's, it's truly, it's staggering how callous or also in some ways vain we are, you know, as a species that mm -hmm. we think we can master this, that we can control it. It's, yeah. it's really shocking, you know, to me. Yeah. 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 Uh, should we, uh, fences and walls as a solution, Hilma says. Yeah, exactly. As if that ever fixed anything in the history of the world. Yeah. I'm, you know, I I like to feel that good things are happening too, you know, that there might be a way to get out of this impasse we find ourselves in, you know. I mean, certainly America is progressing, however clumsily. And, uh, yes, so. I think that's true. And seeing the the sort of level of um, support, you know, for the for the demonstrations that happened last summer, yeah. too, was really hope. In some ways, really made me feel hopeful. Um, you know, I had a hard time moving to this country as a young, you know, as a teenager, because uh, I didn't know. I didn't know about, uh, I mean, I knew, I knew about racism because my parents talked about it, but I, I'd never actually experienced anything like what, what I perceived here when I, when I, when I moved here. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was often attacked for not holding the views that some of my, you know, classmates held. Yeah. But, but, it, and I would tell my parents, you know, that I, I don't understand. And, and I still don't understand all these years later, although I understand better. And I think it's wonderful to see my daughter's generation. They seem so much more um, wise and compassionate, many of them than, than certainly I, we were, I yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I guess my perspective is a little different, you know, because we came here at the beginning of this watershed in American history, you know, the civil rights movement and Vietnam, because we came in 59. And uh, that was a revolutionary period like mm. this one is. Yeah. And then if you want to describe the history, you might want to describe it as 50 years of stagnation, but that's probably unfair. I mean, there was there were all sorts of things that were developing and developing, and now we've reached another watershed, you know, and, and it's interesting to look back, you know, for my generation anyway, to think about this, you know, in terms of the sweep of history. And, what we experienced then, what we've experienced now. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of, uh, I mean, for, I mean, America is going to have problems. I mean, it's like the rest of the world, especially the global South, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you know about the problems there, I mean, you really kind of feel that the way the developed world has turned its back on, you know, just even looking at the problems is really sort of, uh, you know, I mean, I guess one shouldn't be surprised, but if you come from one of those places, if you come from India or Africa or, you know, Brazil, you know, you don't have the luxury. You have mm -hmm. to sort of, yeah. Okay. That makes so. Are there any questions? There's an unanswered. Yes. Question. Yes. It looks like we have a question from Nell Painter. Um, <clears throat> I believe this one is directed at you, Vijay. Um, in that poem, the flag is a sign of neutral welcome. What if it had been a Confederate flag? Well, that's an interesting question now, <laughs> you know, because 
I was a very adventurous kid. You know, I graduated from college when I was 20. I immediately hitchhiked all over the West. I never set foot in the South. I never went anywhere near it, you know. <laughs> I, you know, and there were rednecks in Oregon, of course, you know, uh, you know, in fact, the American Nazi party is very strong in the valley there, even to this day, but you never saw a Confederate flag, you know, their, their racism did not incorporate those symbols in that mythology. And also it was sort of a multiracial world too, especially on the coast, because there were lots of Native Americans and there were lots of it was a diverse world. There were, you know, lots of, you know, Mexican Americans and Mexicans and stuff <clears> like <throat> that. So I never really felt I would encounter a, you know, I mean, if it were a, if it were, if there were a Confederate flag, of course, I would have had to turn around immediately and crawl back into the woods and find some other way to get out. You know, but, uh, yeah. No, um, I mean, the flag is important. The flag is important in that poem. I don't know what its meaning is, but except that I am in America. And but the way I thought of America then was wilderness. You know, I didn't necessarily think of it as the kind of history that occurred in the South, in the, at least in that poem, you know. Mm -hmm. that, um, so now, Vijay, I know you said that you haven't, you hadn't been very inspired um, to do any writing during the pandemic. Um, Kaylee, was that the same for you, or do you, did you write more? I wrote some short essays, uh, including this one. I wrote some other short essays, and I, I strove to make some sense out of um, my place in the world, and 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 I had, I was really so angry about what was going on and about how small my thinking has always been. Like my mind was blown open and I suddenly realized that I know nothing and that I need to really learn a lot more about the world I live in. And so what I did was I wrote, I, 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 I didn't, I was in the middle of a novel and I put it aside. I said, I have to think about this for a while, but I've been writing more about um, my daughter and me and, and, um, finding our way together after this tragedy that we went through. And, and that's a delicate balance too, because I don't want to um, do anything that would compromise her privacy in any way. So that's a whole other kind of situation that I've been dealing with in my work. Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't do very well with my writing. Some people were, a lot of my writer friends were like, this is the way my life always is. I'm alone. I'm at home. I walk the dog. You know, I, I'm, I never go out. I never talk to anybody. So, you know, it's just more time to write. But that didn't happen for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and now what is on your nightstand? What are you both reading right now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading um, The Young Henry of Navarre, Henri de Navarre, which is about Henry IV of France. It's It's by... Um, Heinrich Mann, who's the brother, believe it or not, of uh, Thomas Mann. And it's a really good uh, historical novel about um, a, a hero, a childhood hero of mine that I'm trying to write about in this novel that I put aside. Oh, okay. Interesting. What about you, Jay? Well, I'm reading two books about Bangladesh. One is called The Rise of Islam on the Bengal Frontier which is a book by a great American scholar, Richard Eaton. And then I'm reading uh, The Blood Telegram by Gary Bass, who's a political scientist at Princeton. And it's about the Bangladesh War in 1971. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's a very disturbing Oof. book. You know, that war was a, that was just, uh, and uh, so they're not on my night, table. At night, what I do is I watch, I'm up in Vermont, and I watch return, re, reruns of Perry Mace, you know, from about 9 to 11 on uh, Amazon. Yeah. 
that's reassuring. You know, I, I do that too. Do you like Perry Mason? I like old shows where everything is good and where, you know, everything ends well. They always get the bad right. guy, know. you know, at the it's trials, the, you know, the, know, the good guy gets away and the bad guy right. goes to jail. Those are comforting before bedtime. Oh my God. Yeah. Totally. Right? The simple, you know. simpler way that things, you know, yeah. Nice yeah. break from reality. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think okay. that that is all the time that we have um, for today. Oh, Rita Dove is tuning in. That she, uh, she says she watches reruns of New Tricks, a British. Oh, I'll try that. Series. Me so, too. Yeah, that'll, that should go next on your one. list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Rita. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that that's all the time um, we have for this evening. I want to thank you so much, Vijay and Kaylee, for um, participating in Write America. I want to thank everybody who tuned in tonight. And of course, to the man, Roger Rosenblatt, for uh, dreaming all of this up for us. Uh, don't forget to click the button below the stream here to visit bookreview.com uh, to buy signed copies of Vijay and Kaylee's books. And I hope to see you all right back here next Monday at 7 p.m. for another episode of Write America. Uh, with writers Ursula Heige and Vanessa Cutie. So until then, we will see you next yeah. week. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you.